Chapter 7 of The Dawn of Medieval Europe, 476 to 918, by J. H. B. Masterman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Benedict of Nursia and Columban. At about the same time that Justinian was drawing up his code of Roman law among the splendors of Constantinople, a lonely monk on an Italian mountain was drawing up the rule that was destined to regulate the monastic life of western europe for seven hundred years monasticism had its earliest home in the east where at the end of the fourth century basil of cappadocia drew up a body of regulations for the life of the monasteries the monastic idea gradually spread to the west and in the dark days of the break-up of the roman civilization of gaul and italy many men sought refuge in the austerities of the religious life either in small communities or as hermits in complete isolation among all these men one name stands conspicuous that of benedict of nursia he was born about the year four eighty just after the accession of odoacer to the kingship of italy the little town of nursia which was his birthplace lay under the shadow of the apennines about twenty miles from spoleto his parents were in a good position and were able to give their son an education at rome whither he was sent while still a boy shocked and startled by the wickedness of the city he determined after a time to abandon his studies and adopt the monastic life accompanied by his nurse he set out in search of a deserted place where he might give himself to meditation and prayer and after staying for a time at Aphida, he fled secretly across the hills to Subiaco, where he met a monk named Romanus, who admitted him to the monastic order, and took him to a cave on the hillside where he stayed for three years hidden from the eyes of men. Here Benedict passed through a time of contest, resisting with difficulty the allurements of the world that he had forsaken on one occasion in his determination to conquer unholy desires he is said to have plunged naked into a thicket of thorns and nettles and a beautiful old legend tells how when st francis of assisi visited the monastery seven hundred years after the thorn bushes suddenly turned into roses gradually the fame of the young hermit spread throughout the district and the monks of the neighbourhood monastery of varia requested him to become their abbot a short experience served to show that his rule was too strict for them and he returned for a time to his home in the wilderness but now from all parts of italy men who desired to enter the monastic life flocked to him so that before long there were no less than twelve monasteries around subiaco under his rule about the year five twenty eight moved by a desire for greater solitude and partly also by the opposition of some of the neighbouring clergy benedict with a few friends left subiaco and travelled southwards to monte cassino the celebrated hill about halfway between rome and naples that was destined to become the centre of the benedictine monastic movement it is characteristic of the confusion of the times that the little party of monks found on their arrival that the peasants still offered sacrifice to apollo at an altar on the hillside this altar benedict destroyed erecting in its place a christian church for fifteen years benedict remained at monte cassino and many are the miracles recorded in the life of st benedict by gregory the great which is our chief source of information about him one of the most interesting episodes in gregory's life is the interview between the saint and the great gothic warrior totila totila first put the powers of the holy man to the test by sending his sword-bearer disguised in his armour and attended by his body servants to the abbot who promptly penetrated the disguise and sent the sword-bearer back to his master then in his own person the same totila approached the man of god but when he saw him sitting afar off he did not dare to approach him but cast himself on the ground then when the man of god had twice or thrice said to him rise but still he did not dare to raise himself from the earth benedict the servant of jesus christ condescended to approach the prostrate king 
and caused him to rise he rebuked him for his past deeds and in a few words told him all that should come to pass saying much evil hast thou done much evil art thou doing now at length cease from sin thou shalt enter rome thou shalt cross the sea nine years shalt thou reign in the tenth shalt thou die when he heard these words the king vehemently terrified asked for his prayers and withdrew and from that time forward he was less cruel than aforetime not long afterwards he entered rome and crossed to sicily but in the tenth year of his reign by the judgment of almighty god he lost his kingdom with his life soon after this meeting in five forty three benedict died leaving his monastery of monte cassino as a kind of beacon light shining through the darkness and confusion of the years that followed the rule that benedict drew up for his monks was adopted by other monasteries till it became and remained for hundreds of years the monastic rule for all monks of the west up to this time the monasteries of western europe had adopted rules from the east but had been very lax in discipline benedict's regula provided a uniform system of monastic life strict enough to curb the hot passions and self-will of the time yet not so strict as to be impossible to enforce benedict himself describes them as a school of divine service in which nothing too heavy or rigorous will be established the two central principles of the regula are labour and obedience each monk must spend seven hours a day in manual labour and two hours in reading he must also yield prompt and willing obedience to the commands of the abbot who however was not an absolute monarch over his little realm since he was obliged to consult the monks in chapter about all questions of importance affecting the monastery on the death of an abbot his successor was to be elected by the monks every monastery was to have its own mill bakery and gardens so that the monks would not be obliged to depend on the outside world for supplies hospitality was to be offered freely to strangers and to the poor let every stranger be received says the rule as though he were christ himself for it is christ himself who shall one day say to us i was a stranger and ye took me in absolute community of goods existed within the monastery every monk being obliged on admission to renounce all private property the monks were recruited from two sources there were first the children entrusted by their parents to the monastery and secondly the men of mature age who sought shelter and monastic life from the troubles and temptations of the world according to benedict's rule these candidates were to be subjected to severe tests and a year of probation as novices before they were admitted to membership once admitted they bound themselves by the strictest vows to remain for life in the monastic order the rules regulate the life of the monks in every detail seven times a day they were to gather in the chapel for services which consisted largely of psalms chanted by the monks at meals which were simple but adequate each monk served in turn they slept not in separate cells but in one long dormitory and by the rules of the order were to sleep in their day clothes and shoes and to train themselves to do with very little sleep so completely did the rule of st benedict supersede all other monastic rules in western europe that charles the great two hundred and fifty years later ordered a careful inquiry to be made as to whether there were any monks in his dominions who observed any other rule than that of st benedict and later monastic rules such as those of cluny in the tenth century or of cito in the twelfth were only attempts to interpret in relation to the needs of later times the regula of the father of western monasticism the age that followed the death of benedict was the great missionary age of western monasticism it would be impossible to tell in detail the story of the labours of the monks who carried the christian faith to the teutonic and slavonic peoples of western europe one of the greatest of them columban may serve as a type for the rest in the sixth and seventh centuries ireland became a great centre of literary culture and of missionary effort its schools helped 
to keep alive the study of the great latin authors whose works were in danger of being forgotten and its missionaries went out into all the lands of western europe columban 543 to 615 was born in ireland in the same year that benedict died at monte cassino he was educated in the liberal arts of grammar rhetoric and geometry and fled to monastic life to escape the allurements of the world he first went to bangor and then with twelve monks as his companions to gaul where finding religion and morality at a low ebb he set himself to the task of reviving them he then settled in burgundy under king gontram who gave him a disused castle on the site of an old roman town at luxeuil in the forest country of the vosges mountains there a great monastery grew up over which columban exercised stern discipline his rule was much stricter than that of st benedict too strict indeed to be kept by any but an elect few columban's irish customs soon brought him into contest with the bishops of gaul and to this was added a contest with brunhilda and her grandson who had succeeded gontram in five ninety three as king in burgundy as a result he was expelled from luxeuil after visiting the kings of neustria and austrasia he determined to undertake the directly missionary work to which he had long been drawn and settled at Bregenz among the still heathen alemanni his chief helper was gaul the apostle of swiss christianity and founder of the far-famed monastery of st gaul the methods of the missionaries were not those best calculated to avert opposition we read of their throwing the idols of the people into the lake and even burning down the temples they were reduced to living on such fruits and fish as they could find for themselves obliged at last to leave alemannia columban crossed the alps into italy and found his way to the court of agilolf the lombard king whose wife theodolinda of bavaria had already done much to bring christianity to the lombards agilolf gave columban some land at bobbio in the apennines and there he built a monastery which became a great missionary centre for the conversion of the lombards from arianism in his old age he left bobbio to pass his closing days in solitude at trebia and there he died in 615 columban's rule gradually gave place in the monasteries he had founded to the milder and more practicable rule of st benedict and the three great monasteries of luxeuil st gall and bobbio remained for long as centres of light and learning in burgundy switzerland and northern italy from luxeuil the monastic system spread into neustria and a number of daughter monasteries grew up of which jumiege and remiremont are the most famous End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Dawn of Medieval Europe, four seventy six to nine eighteen by J. H. B. Masterman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Rise of Mohammedanism. In an earlier chapter, we have traced the history of the empire to the accession of Heraclius in six ten the new emperor succeeded to an empire that seemed on the verge of dissolution the slavs were pouring across the balkans and the persians had carried their attacks into the heart of asia minor to meet these dangers heraclius had an army disorganized by mismanagement an empty treasury and a corrupt body of officials under these circumstances it is not strange that for the first ten years of his reign he could do little to make headway against the invaders disaster followed disaster in six thirteen damascus fell and in the following year the capture of jerusalem by the persian king Khosros sent a thrill of horror over christendom two years later egypt fell almost without resistance into the hands of the persians so hopeless did the prospect appear that heraclius is said to have considered the plan of moving the capital of the empire to carthage but the rumour of his intentions roused the people of constantinople to new energy 
a kind of crusade was proclaimed by the clergy who offered the wealth of the church to equip the armies of the empire most important of all heraclius resolved no longer to entrust the war to his generals but to assume supreme command himself 622 to 627 after patching up a treaty with the avars who had actually penetrated within forty miles of constantinople itself heraclius started for the east where in six years of strenuous warfare he proved himself the greatest general of his age it is impossible to tell in detail the story of heraclius's campaigns which closed with a great victory at nineveh and the sack of Khosrow's palace near Testaphon. Meanwhile, in 626, the Avars, acting as allies of the Persians, besieged Constantinople, which was splendidly defended by Bonus the patrician, and by the Roman fleet, which guarded the Bosphorus, and so prevented the Persians from sending help to their allies. In 628, Heraclius came home in triumph, bringing peace to the empire and the spoils of jerusalem including the true cross which the persians had been compelled to surrender but while persia and the empire were fighting out their long contest a new power was rising in the east which was destined to sweep both away in five seventy five years after the death of justinian and two years after the lombard invasion of italy mohammed was born at mecca an important commercial town in southern arabia the arabs of this district had attained to a certain measure of civilization and lived under a strict system of tribal law their religion was a kind of polytheism each tribe having its own tutelary deities a supreme god allah was vaguely conceived of behind these tribal gods but the whole religious system was a feat and had little influence over conduct or life mohammed's family was a poor one but at the age of twenty-four he entered commercial life as partner with a widow named khadijah whom he shortly afterwards married through some relatives of his wife he came into contact with a body of religious reformers the hanifs who sought for the secret of holiness of life in the rejection of polytheism and complete submission islam to the will of allah influenced by them he began to spend long periods in prayer and meditation till at length he became conscious of a mission to teach the truths he had learned to the men of his city his teaching was received with bitter hostility and those who avowed themselves his followers were persecuted and in some cases driven out of the city at last mohammed resolved on a decisive step and in six twenty two having sent his followers on before him he fled to medina this is the celebrated harika or flight of mohammed from which the followers of the prophet date the rise of the new religion at medina the new prophet soon found himself undisputed master of the city and organized a political commonwealth under laws drawn up by him his system was designed to bind together all who accepted it in the closest bonds of union and to sever them from the unbelieving world by a great gulf he borrowed something from judaism and something from the corrupt forms of christianity with which he had come in contact in southern arabia but the fundamental article of his creed the unity of god he had learned from the hanifs with them it was a truth for quiet meditation but in the hands of the prophet it became the war cry of a new contest that shook the arab world to its foundations in december six twenty three mohammed and his followers won the battle of bakir over a force of arabs from mecca and from that time the external history of mohammedanism is the history of an advancing tide of conquest that swept over all the east rolled as a devastating wave over the provinces of egypt and north africa and was checked at last in the west only by the barrier of the pyrenees and the sword of charles martel before mohammed died in six thirty two all arabia was under his sway his successor or khalifa abu bakir after suppressing a rebellion among the arab followers of the prophet launched two great armies against the persians and the empire 
the conquest of persia was rapid and complete by the end of 641 all the lands over which the persian king had ruled passed under the sway of the moslem power in the same year egypt was overrun and absorbed almost without resistance in the ever-growing territories of the arab conquerors meanwhile the invasion of syria checked for a few months by the forces of the empire went forward under the leadership of the fierce leader khaled the sword of god in 634 the invaders won the terrific battle of yarmouk almost exterminating a force of eighty thousand imperial troops damascus was sacked next year and heraclius took the field in person only to find himself helpless against the fierce fanaticism of the new foe while these conquests were in progress the khalifa died and was succeeded by omar the greatest of all the successors of the prophet under his wise rule the work of conquest went on antioch fell in 637 and in the same year jerusalem surrendered so great was the veneration of the moslems for the city that they accounted second only to mecca in sacredness that omar crossed the desert expressly to receive its surrender in person on the site of the temple he built the great mosque that still bears his name with unusual toleration he granted to the christians the control of the holy places heraclius lived to see the whole province of mesopotamia overrun by saracen hordes and the seaport of caesarea captured he died in 641 just before the fall of alexandria and the beginning of the attack on asia minor after a short period of confusion heraclius was succeeded by his grandson constantinus or constans as the western chroniclers call him 641 to 668 during his boyhood the course of saracen conquest went on though more slowly alexandria was recaptured by the empire and recaptured again and partly destroyed by the moslems part of north africa fell into their hands they also began to develop a navy which gradually grew large enough to dispute the mastery of the mediterranean with the imperial fleet they won a great victory in a naval engagement off the coast of lycia in 652 the emperor himself only escaping with difficulty but soon after this the empire secured a respite through the outbreak of civil war between two rival candidates for the caliphate muavia of syria and ali of mesopotamia some years passed before the saracen conquests were resumed during this time constantinus made a last attempt to reorganize the sadly diminished provinces of the empire now consisting of asia minor the western part of north africa a strip of country round the coast of the balkan peninsula and some parts of italy constantinus spent the last six years of his life in italy and sicily trying to restore the prestige of the empire in the west after a successful campaign in southern italy he settled at syracuse within accessible reach of north africa where in 663 the saracens renewed their attacks on the empire before his death in 668 asia minor was also suffering from their ravages for eight years constantine pogonatus the bearded who succeeded carried on a struggle with the invaders the most notable episode of the war being a great siege of constantinople by the saracens in 673 which ended in their disastrous defeat the only other event of note in the reign of this emperor was the arrival in the balkan peninsula of a new body of invaders the bulgarians they were a tribe of hunnish race but they soon began to unite with the slav tribes who were already settled in the district into which they came and gradually lost their hunnish language and characteristics on his death in 685 constantine was succeeded by his son justinian a youth of seventeen 685 to 695 who was encouraged by a successful attack on the bulgarians and by the internal feuds that now divided the moslem world to attempt to reconquer syria 
the campaign proved a complete failure and justinian developed into a bloodthirsty and cruel tyrant finally a palace revolt drove him from the throne and plunged the empire into twenty years of complete chaos meanwhile the tide of moslem conquest rolled on in six ninety eight carthage finally fell and the whole of north africa passed under the sway of the saracens the province had long been divided by religious controversies and had already been harried by the vandals but the ruins that still remain along the coast of north africa suffice to show how rich and prosperous the great cities that fringed the shore of the mediterranean had been in the days when rome dwelt secure and unchallenged fifteen years later sardinia fell into the hands of the saracens and cappadocia and pontus were overrun in the following years the doom of the empire seemed inevitable and an expedition was already marching against constantinople when leo the isaurian a general in the roman army won the imperial throne and began the struggle that was destined to preserve constantinople for centuries as the great bulwark of europe against the followers of the prophet a little before this check in the east the saracens had won their last great success in the west for a century the visigothic kingdom in spain had been crumbling into decay originally arian the visigothic kings had now become stern champions of orthodoxy and jews and arians alike suffered bitter persecutions about the year 710 the storm of moslem invasion broke on the disorganized and enfeebled kingdom a vast horde of arabs and moors landed at the spot gibraltar that still bears the name of their leader tarik jebel tarik the hill of tarik smote the last gothic king roderick in a great battle on the banks of the guadalete and within three years all spain excepting the mountainous districts of the north had passed into their hands a land that impotent sovereigns fanatical clergy turbulent nobles and downtrodden serfs had left helpless in its hour of need was now destined under the rule of great moslem chiefs to become a centre of art and learning and industry except for italy and greece and the lands fringing the balkan peninsula the whole of the coastline of the mediterranean had now passed under the sway of the mohammedan power in the east the battlements of constantinople still frowned defiance across the bosphorus and in the west the strong nations beyond the pyrenees were ready to dispute in one great day of battle the further advance of the crescent flag the menace of this great advance of moslem power awakened among the still unconquered peoples of northern europe a new sense of common interest christianity itself was now in danger and watching for some champion to arise to organize the forces of resistance around such a champion there would inevitably gather all the associations of the roman imperial idea so in less than a hundred years after the saracen conquest of spain charles the great was crowned in the great basilica of rome and the holy roman empire began End of chapter eight chapter nine of the dawn of medieval europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by j h b masterman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami the lombards in italy and the rise of the papacy we left italy cleared of her gothic invaders and ruled by imperial officers but in reality much of northern italy had become a depopulated desert whose empty and uncultivated plains were only broken by an occasional garrison town into these ownerless territories there came in five sixty eight a new tribe of barbarian immigrants the lombards among the various teutonic tribes they had been almost the last to move southward and for nearly a century had occupied the lands along the danube adjoining those of the ostrogoths and the jepidae their name of lombards langobardi was probably derived from the long beards that gave a ferocious aspect to these fierce warriors a detachment of them 
fought as mercenaries under narses in five fifty two so gaining their earliest knowledge of italy and fifteen years later after assisting the avars to exterminate the jebedi the whole tribe moved south under its king alboin and poured almost unopposed into the plains of northern italy one by one the roman garrison town surrendered till ravenna alone remained as an imperial stronghold but the new lombard kingdom had scarcely been organized when alboin died in 572 the story of his death is dramatically told by paul the deacon the historian of the lombards after the defeat of the jeopardi alboin had the skull of jeopard king cunamund whose daughter rosamund he had married made into a drinking bowl and in a drunken carouse in verona in the year 572 he called for rosamund and bade her drink joyfully from her father's head enraged by the insult rosamund procured the assassination of the king deprived of their leader the lombards broke into smaller parties each under a chief and spread farther and farther into central and southern italy they made no attempt at systematic conquest but settled wherever fancy led them so that central italy gradually became dotted over with small lombard settlements intermixed with those of the native italians the native population was probably spared and reduced to a condition of serfdom farther south the two great duchies of spoleto and beneventum grew up only a few fragments of italy remained in the hands of the empire chiefly along the coast which possessed no attractions to people like the lombards unaccustomed to a seafaring life these scattered possessions of the empire were ruled by the exarch of ravenna though the actual extent of his authority over rome or naples must have been very slight it would be a tedious task to trace in detail the history of the lombard kingdom which was re-established in 583 by the election of Autari, 583 to 590. His marriage with Theodolinda, the daughter of the Duke of Bavaria, brought the Lombards in touch with Christian influences, and about the year 590 the Lombard king Agilulf, who had succeeded to the kingdom and the hand of Theodolinda, was baptized with many of his followers the first half of the seventh century was a time of prosperity and expansion for the lombard kingdom district after district was won from the empire which was too much occupied in eastern wars to be able to defend its provinces in the west agilulf who reigned for twenty-five years from five ninety to six fifteen was succeeded after a short interval by another great ruler rotaris who ruled from 636 to 652, and who is known to history as the author of the first code of Lombard laws, drawn up with the counsel and consent of our advisers and of all our armed forces. Rotaris's code shows little trace of Roman influence. Evidently, the process of fusion between the races had hardly yet begun. While the Lombards were settling in northern Italy, Rome was passing slowly out of the hand of the empire and into the hands of her new rulers, the popes. From the first beginning of the Christian church, Rome, as the capital of the empire, and as the church associated with the two great apostles, Peter and Paul, gave to its bishop a position of special honor among the bishops of the West. And in the centuries that followed, several causes tended to increase the importance of the Roman see in the arian controversy of the fourth century the bishop of rome had been the strongest champion of orthodoxy in the west and when constantine moved the capital of his empire to constantinople the bishop became the most important figure in the old capital in the east the bishops of the three great cities of constantinople antioch and alexandria were granted the title of patriarch and a certain primacy of dignity over the other dioceses of the east in the west the only other bishop whose position could at all rival that of the bishop of rome was the bishop of carthage and when the vandal invasion swept much of the organized church life of north africa away 
the roman see became undisputed head of the younger christian churches that were gradually growing up in illyria gaul britain and elsewhere at this period the bishop of rome may be regarded as exercising four kinds of authority as bishop he exercised immediate control over the city of rome as metropolitan he superintended the seven bishops whose diocese lay around the city the seven cardinal bishops as they were afterwards called as patriarch he had a somewhat undefined authority within the whole of the prefecture of italy while as the senior bishop of western europe he claimed a general right to intervene in all church matters where the interests of the whole church were affected the emperors of the fifth century ruling either at constantinople or ravenna were not unwilling to concede large powers of jurisdiction to the roman bishops while keeping the patriarchs of constantinople more strictly under their own authority the decline of antioch and alexandria gradually left the patriarch of constantinople as the senior bishop in the east and in the twenty eighth canon of the council of chalcedon an attempt was made to place the two sees of constantinople and rome in a position of equal dignity but this canon rome declined to accept and the long contest between the eastern and western churches may be said to have begun from that point leo the great four forty to four sixty one was among all the early bishops of rome the one who did most to extend the authority of the roman see both by the vigour with which he asserted the authority of the bishop of that see as the successor of st peter and by the ability with which he intervened in theological controversies both in the east where he led the battle against eutychianism and in spain where he supported the orthodox party against the priscillianists footnote the eutychians were the followers of eutyches a monk of the fifth century who asserted that our lord's human nature was absorbed in the divine his opinions were condemned at the council of chalcedon but were revived in the later monophysite and monothelite heresies heresies that taught that our lord has only one nature or one will the priscillianists were a sect that arose in spain in the fourth century partly as a reaction against the worldly tendencies of the church their doctrinal teaching appears to have been a sort of gnosticism they were ruthlessly stamped out by a policy of persecution in which their leader priscillian suffered death End footnote. leo was incomparably the greatest figure in the ecclesiastical world of his time and though his successes were men of less striking character they kept most of the ground that he had won with the arian theodoric the bishops of rome generally kept on good terms we have already seen the only notable exception in the case of john i whose embassy to constantinople ended so disastrously for himself and the peace of the world the pope as we may now begin to call him was elected by the clergy senate and people of rome but as elections had not infrequently led to faction fights and disputes theodoric tried to introduce a more satisfactory method of appointment in five twenty six by nominating felix as pope and felix in his turn issued a letter to the clergy and senate nominating boniface the archdeacon as his successor a period of confusion and party contests followed and while this was going on the gothic rule in italy came to an end and the imperial authority again became supreme for some time the popes were the nominees of the faction in power at the byzantine court vigilius five thirty seven to five fifty five and pelagius the first five fifty five to five sixty were imposed on rome by the emperors and they were followed by three insignificant popes and then by the restorer of the papacy gregory the great by this time the lombard invaders had profoundly changed the position of the bishops of rome toward the empire for not only did the presence in italy of a common foe draw the pope and the emperor into friendly relations but also the lombards practically cut off the territories around rome from the imperial lands round ravenna and so threw the popes on their own resources for defence and organization 
for centuries the bishops of rome had been receiving grants of lands around rome and elsewhere ever since the restriction of the eastern empire had emancipated the ecclesiastical potentate from secular control the first and most abiding object of his schemes and prayers had been the acquisition of territorial wealth in the neighbourhood of the capital he had indeed a sort of justification for rome a city with neither trade nor industry was crowded with poor for whom it devolved on the bishop to provide the revenues of this patrimonium petri as it was called were applied not only for the relief of the poor but also for the maintenance of the pope and his clergy and it was natural that the idea of territorial sovereignty should grow up in connection with it as soon as imperial authority had ceased to be more than nominal gregory the great came of a noble roman family and was born about the year five forty while studying for his father's profession of magistrate gregory was taught to love religion by the precepts and example of his mother sylvia when he was only a little over thirty years of age he was appointed by justin the second as praetor urbis an office of great importance and dignity but on his father's death a few years later he renounced the secular life disposed of the considerable sum that he had inherited in founding seven monasteries and himself became a monk from austerities that were permanently injuring his health he was rescued by pope benedict the first who ordained him as deacon and sent him to constantinople as an envoy gregory stayed some time at constantinople and then returned to become abbot of the monastery that he had founded in rome in five ninety pelagius the second died leaving rome in dire distress with the lombards ravaging outside the walls and the plague and famine destroying within the general instinct turned to gregory as the man for the hour and he was unanimously elected in spite of his own reluctance as pope his first work was to call for a season of repentance and to institute processional litanies a monument of these litanies still remains in the name of the castle of st angelo in rome for it was said that on the site on which that castle now stands gregory saw as the procession went by the avenging angel sheathing his sword the task that lay before the new pope was a sufficiently discouraging one as he himself says the roman church was like an old and violently scattered ship admitting water on all sides its timbers rotten shaken by daily storms and sounding of wreck immediately on his accession he set about the work of internal reform he regulated the monasteries placed their business arrangements in the hands of laymen endeavoured to enforce a rule of celibacy among the secular clergy wrote a manual of episcopal duties the regula pastoralis which remained for centuries a textbook for all bishops of the west he also introduced those changes in the method of chanting that are still associated with his name and established schools of gregorian music in rome he next proceeded to place on a business footing the administration of the patrimony of st peter appointing rectores or defensores to manage the lands that belonged to the sea in italy africa gaul and elsewhere we see from his letters how carefully he supervised the work of these officers and how earnestly he tried to guard against oppression or misgovernment on the estates that belonged to the church the revenues received from these lands were divided into four equal parts for the pope the clergy the fabric and services of the churches and the poor gregory's own benevolences were on a colossal scale while this work of internal reform was in progress external affairs claimed the attention of the pope the relations between the emperor and the pope needed defining the raids of the lombards required to be curbed and the task of evangelizing the still heathen parts of europe awaited fulfilment gregory's relations with the empire need not be considered in detail while recognizing the imperial authority gregory guarded jealously the independence of the church in spiritual things and more than once he came into collision with morris on such questions as the appointment of bishops these collisions may serve to explain the extraordinary letter of congratulation written by gregory to focus after his cold-blooded murder of morris and his children 
the relations between the empire and the pope were further complicated by a quarrel that arose between john the patriarch of constantinople and gregory due to the claim made by the former to the title of universal bishop a claim that gregory passionately resented but did not succeed in inducing the patriarch to surrender gregory's chosen title for himself a title ever since borne by the pope was servus servorum dei with the lombards gregory tried to establish friendly relations the marriage of theodolinda gave the pope a friend at the lombard court but the task of protecting rome from lombard ravages was made more difficult by the unwillingness of romanus the exarch of ravenna to agree to any peace with the invaders more than once agilulf threatened to besiege rome and the city was reduced to great distress but in his letters to the emperor gregory represents the exactions of the imperial officers as more grievous than even the depredations of the lombards the empire could neither defend rome nor leave it to itself however in five ninety nine gregory succeeded in bringing about a peace between the lombard king and the exarch it was not only the lombards from the north who proved a thorn in the side of the pope the dukes of spoleto and beneventum were troublesome neighbours and the exarch practically left to gregory the task of organizing the defence of the imperial territories in the south of italy gregory appointed civil and military officers himself he nominated constantius tribune of naples when that city was hard pressed by the lombards and entrusted the administration of napi in southern tuscany to leontius he made peace on his own account with the lombards when they were at war with the imperial representative and asserted that his own station was higher than that of the exarch all this greatly enhanced the prestige of the papacy and laid the foundation of those territorial claims that were destined to play so large a part in the subsequent history of the roman church gregory was also a zealous promoter of the missionary activity of the church his most notable achievement in this direction was the mission to england which had lapsed into paganism after the anglo-saxon conquest it was while he was abbot and papal secretary under pelagius that the well-known incident is recorded to have occurred of his meeting the northumbrian children exposed for sale in the forum of rome he is said to have actually started for england when the outcry of the roman people compelled the pope to recall him eight years after he became pope he sent augustine on the mission to england the history of which belongs to english rather than european history gregory's pastoral care extended over the whole of western europe he wrote letters of congratulation and good advice to recared the visigothic king on his renunciation of arianism at the council of toledo in five eighty nine he corresponded in friendly fashion with the bishops of gaul and their frankish sovereigns he tried to wean the irish bishops by peaceable discussion from the heretical opinions that they held gregory died in 604 having in his fifteen years of rule raised the apostolic see to a new position of authority in europe and laid the foundation for those claims that reached their full expression nearly five hundred years later for more than a century after the death of gregory the papal chair was filled by men of no special importance nominees for the most part of the emperor or his exarch the only important exception was martin the first six forty nine to six fifty three whose opposition to the efforts of constantinus to induce monothelites and defenders of orthodoxy to live together in peace brought him into collision with the emperor who lured him to constantinople and there arraigned him on a charge of political intrigue and had him deposed and imprisoned till his death a few months later the anarchy that followed the death of constantine v once more threw on the popes the work of providing for their own defence and so helped to inaugurate a new period of advance in the powers of the papacy this new chapter in the history of rome opens with the election of gregory the second to the papal chair in seven fifteen the latter half of the seventh century is also a period of comparative unimportance in the history of the lombards rotarus was succeeded by his son who was shortly afterwards murdered 
and a nephew of Theodolinda then reigned for ten years, leaving the throne on his death to his two sons. Between the two heirs war soon broke out, and Grimuald, Duke of Beneventum, seized the crown, and for nearly ten years kept the Lombard territories intact, in spite of the attempts of Constantinus to re-establish the imperial authority. On his death, the Lombard nobles summoned back one of the brothers whom Grimoald had chased from the kingdom, Bertani, whose seventeen years of rule were a time of peace and good government in the kingdom. His son, Cunibert, who succeeded on his death in 688, was disturbed by rebellions among his nobles, and a time of civil wars between rival claimants to the throne lasted till the accession of Liutprand in 712. Thus, early in the 8th century, the papacy and the Lombard crown passed almost simultaneously into stronger hands, and the history of Italy becomes once more full of interest. End of chapter 9chapter ten of the dawn of medieval europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by j h b masterman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami the mayors of the palace in a previous chapter we carried the history of the frankish kingdom down to the end of the sixth century after the ferocious record of the rivalries and contests of brunhilda and fredegonda the chronicles of the merovingian kings become a dreary record of ineffective figures that pass over the stage in long succession decorated with the flowing hair that was the sign of royalty among the franks but neither wielding nor apparently desiring any real power but as the merovingian kings degenerated their power passed into the hands of a new body of men the mayors of the palace the title of major domus or magister palatii was borrowed from the old imperial regime the office grew up naturally as the frank government became organized originally a household officer of the court the mayor of the palace became like the justiciar in norman england the king's right-hand man controlling the administration when the king was at the wars and watching over the relation of the loides to the crown where the supreme power was in the hands of a minor or of a woman the power of the mayor was necessarily augmented from the first there seems to have been a difference between the mayors of neustria and burgundy who were the champions of royal authority against the nobles and those of austrasia who appear rather as the champions of the rights of the nobles against the crown as a result of this the mayoralty in austrasia tended to become an hereditary office held by the leading noble family of the kingdom while the mayor in neustria is more often than not a man of humble origin raised to power by the favour of the crown dr hodgkin thinks it possible to detect in the position of the mayors of austrasia the first beginnings of a protest by the teutonic eastern division of the frankish kingdom against the claims of the western kingdom of neustria to be the true centre of the frankish empire it is attractive to think of the great austrasian mayors as the earliest champions of german national independence the great family with which for centuries the fate of the frankish kingdoms was destined to be associated first appears in history at the moment when brunhilda was making her last stand against clotaire son of fredegonda among the nobles who attached themselves to the cause of clotaire was pippin afterwards known as pippin of landen and arnulf a year later the see of metz falling vacant the people petitioned for the appointment of arnulf who lived circa five eighty to six forty arnulf was still a layman but he had for some reason desired to lay aside secular life and retire into a monastery as his wife doda had done with his consent some years before but to this the king would not consent and as bishop of metz he was retained among the advisers of the crown while administering his diocese with self-denying devotion at last in six twenty six his importunities wrested from the young king dagobert 
a reluctant consent to his retirement and he departed first to the monastery of remurement in the vosges and then with a few companions to the deeper solitude of horemburg where he spent the last three years of his life rejoicing to undertake the most menial offices he left two sons the younger of whom anze Giesel, married pippin's daughter bega and was the father of pippin of herstal pippin of landen who ruled from six twenty two to six thirty nine remained in the world of politics from which his friend had fled and in six twenty two became mayor of the palace in austrasia then under the rule of dagobert as sub-king perhaps his control of the young sovereign was over strict at all events when his father's death raised dagobert to the kingship of the whole frankish realm and transferred his capital from Metz to paris pippin seems to have been for some time in practical captivity dagobert's death in six thirty eight set him free to return to austrasia but in the following year he died lamented by all the men of austrasia pippin left his son grimoald who three years later secured the position of mayor of austrasia under Siegebert, in spite of the opposition of many of the austrasian nobles in neustria where Siegebert's brother was king his mother appointed a relation of the young king as mayor and so for a time averted the danger of the extension of austrasian supremacy over neustria in six fifty six a significant event occurred in that year Sigebert died and was succeeded by his son a boy of eight years old grimoald thinking that the rule of faineon kings had lasted long enough sent the boy away secretly to an irish monastery and raised his own son childebert to the austrasian throne but the change was premature the austrasian nobles rose in support of the royal house and grimoald was carried off to paris where clovis the second was now ruling there he was confined to a dungeon and bound with torturing chains and at length as he was worthy of death for what he had done to his lord death finished him with mighty torments grimoald's premature bid for sovereignty seemed for a time to have ruined the prospects of his house and the next thirty years of frankish history is a dreary record of confusion and disintegration the peoples on the frontiers of the frankish realm began to shake themselves free from the frankish yoke and thuringia bavaria and the vents beyond the elbe defied the impotent rulers who kept the semblance of authority at metz or paris the only strong man of the time was ebroin mayor of neustria whose character is drawn by the possibly biased ecclesiastical chroniclers of the time appears as a compound of cruelty avarice and ambition after a few years of his rule the nobles of neustria led by leodegar bishop of autun whose name is still familiar to us as st leger called the austrasian king to their help and seized ebroin and his puppet king ebroin was compelled to take monastic vows in the monastery of luxeuil and for a time leodegar administered neustria till a fresh intrigue sent him to join his late enemy at luxeuil next year the king died and three puppet claimants were set up by different factions taking advantage of the confusion ebroin escaped from his monastery and succeeded in securing the office of mayor of neustria again under his old puppet king theoderich his first act as mayor was to fetch his rival leodegar from luxeuil and cause him to be blinded and a few years later beheaded an act of cruelty that helped to earn the bishop the title of saint for seven years longer ebroin ruled neustria and burgundy keeping down with a firm hand all attempts to dispute his authority his only serious contest was in six seventy nine when the austrasian nobles with pippin of herstal grandson of the old mayor of austrasia at their head dared the issue of battle with the neustrian tyrant but they were defeated with cruel slaughter and their lands laid waste by the victorious neustrians at last in six eighty one the murder of ebroin brought his rule to an end and opened the way for the ascendancy of the austrasian leader at the head of a vast host of austrasians 
pippin of herstal marched against the neustrian king and a feeble person whom the neustrian nobles had chosen as mayor and at a great battle at testri put to flight the armies of the western kingdom and established his authority over the whole frankish realm the battle of testri is one of the most important turning points in the history of western europe for it raised to unchallenged supremacy the great family with whose fortunes those of the frankish kingdom were to be associated for more than three hundred years till the death of the last carolingian king in nine eighty seven severed the last link between east and west francia and gave to france a new dynasty and a new destiny warned by the fate of his uncle pippin wisely contented himself with the substance of power without laying claim to the name of king he might probably have set up as independent king of austrasia where he seems to have been the unchallenged head of the nobles but he preferred to attempt the harder task of holding the frankish kingdom together making austrasia the centre of his rule he set up his sons as soon as they were old enough as mayors of neustria and burgundy the special task that pippin set himself was the reduction of the peoples who had taken advantage of the confusion of the period to throw off the frankish yoke in a great battle on the northern frontier he defeated ratbod the king of frisia and compelled him to acknowledge the frankish overlordship and as the price of the marriage of the frisian king's daughter with his son grimwald he compelled him to allow christian missionaries free access to his people turning from the rhine to the danube pippin reduced the thuringians schwabians and bavarians to subjection and so re-established the ancient frontiers of the frankish kingdom where the sword had opened the way the cross followed in six ninety a young northumbrian monk willibrord moved by missionary zeal landed with eleven companions in frisia and finding little encouragement there went south and at pippin's request settled at utrecht as a missionary in the west frisian territory that had lately been ceded to the franks with the approval of the pope which he went to rome to secure he laboured there for six years and then went again to rome to be consecrated as bishop of utrecht a long episcopate gave him the opportunity of carrying the christian faith not only to the frisians but also to the danes in the north and the unevangelized parts of francia a few years after willibrord's consecration another english monk arrived in rome to offer himself for work among the heathen tribes of germany this was winfried of crediton better known by his later name of boniface seven eighteen to seven fifty four he made an unsuccessful attempt to gain access to frisia and after two years in england returned to the work and was sent northward by pope gregory the second with a general commission to preach in germany in seven twenty three after a strikingly successful mission among the hessians and saxons he returned to rome and was consecrated as bishop taking at the same time an oath of allegiance to the pope which marks an important step in the subjection of northern europe to papal authority for thirty years from seven eighteen to seven fifty four boniface is the central figure in the history of the german church and his influence served to keep that church in close subjection to papal authority he died in seven fifty four slain by some heathen to whom he had gone as preacher of the gospel boniface was statesman and scholar as well as missionary an able administrator as well as an earnest preacher and his aim was to civilize as well as to christianize the heathen of his fatherland the sanction of the papal see was almost indispensable for the success of his efforts for the helpless feebleness of the merovingian kings and the strong self-assertion of the carolingians were altogether unfavorable to the growth and development of the church it is no exaggeration to say that since the days of the great apostle of the gentiles no missionary of the gospel has been more eminent in labors in perils in self-devotion and in that tenacity yet elasticity of purpose which never loses sight of its aim even when compelled to approach it by some other route than that which it proposed to itself originally End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the dawn of medieval europe 
476 to 918 by J. H. B. Masterman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Charles Martel ruled 715 to 741. Few things are more striking in the history of the period with which we are dealing than the contrast between the long succession of ineffective and shadowy Merovingians who followed one another on the Frankish throne and the series of great leaders of the house of St. Arnulf, who for more than a hundred years hold the destinies of Europe in their hands. Even in the declining fortunes of their house, a hundred years later, the Carolingians retained much of the strenuous vigor of their great ancestors, and only when the direct line of succession ended in 987 did the crown of the West Frankish realm fall to another royal house. Pippin of Herstal ruled over the Franks for twenty-seven years, and had two sons to whom he hoped to hand on the succession but in 708 drogo died leaving two sons and shortly after grimuald was murdered leaving one little son teudewald now eight years of age pippin had now to make fresh provision for the future and he appointed the little teudewald as his heir with his wife plectrudis as regent but besides his wife plectrudis pippin who like most of the frankish chiefs retained in his domestic life traces of the earlier polygamous conditions of pre-christian times had another wife alphaida by whom he had one son charles now a young man ambitious and stout of heart and little likely to acquiesce in any arrangement that ousted him from any share in his father's dominions a striking drama follows in seven fifteen pippin died and the merovingian king now aged fifteen received as his mayor of the palace a child of eight under the guardianship of an aged and imperious grandmother her first step was to seize and imprison charles her next to raise an army to meet an insurrection of the neustrian nobles who having set up a certain regenfried as rival mayor and allied themselves with the heathen frisians and saxons poured into Austrasia and drove Plectrudis and her grandson into Cologne. In the confusion, Charles escaped from prison and rallied the Austrasian nobles to the support of his house. But Chilperic, king of Neustria, who seems to have had more energy than most of his family, marched against him and, with the help of old Ratbod of Frisia, defeated him near Cologne plectrudis was reduced to purchase peace by the surrender of most of the royal treasures and the acknowledgment of the claims of the neustrian king but charles fell upon the neustrian army as it went homewards in triumph through the ardennes and smote it into headlong retreat at Amblève. the king and his mayor barely escaping with their lives next year he broke into neustria routed chilperic at vincy and chased him to paris as the young king of Austrasia had died in the preceding year, Charles now discovered a new puppet king, Clotaire by name, whom he seated on the throne, becoming himself mayor of the palace. Then followed the series of great blows that earned for Charles the name of Martel, the Hammer. He drove the Saxons beyond the frontiers, wrested West Friesland from Rotboat, and then marched into Neustria chilperic and his mayor regenfried summoned to their aid udo of aquitaine who had carved out for himself an independent duchy south of the loire but charles having detached udo from the alliance crushed the neustrian forces in a last great battle near soissons regenfried maintained for a time the semblance of resistance while the neustrian king made terms with his great enemy and Charles's puppet king, having conveniently died, became king of all the Franks, with Charles as mayor of the kingdoms and undisputed master of the Frankish realm. Einhard, Charles the Great's biographer, has described in a well-known passage the position of these Merovingian kings at this closing period of their history. 
for many years the house of the merovingians was destitute of vigour and had nothing illustrious about it except the empty name of king for the rulers of their palace possessed both the wealth and power of the kingdom bearing the name of mayor and had charge of all great matters of state nothing remained to the king except the name of king his flowing locks and long beard he sat on his throne and played at ruling gave audience to envoys and dismissed them with the answers that he had been taught or even commanded to give the mayor of the palace allowed him to live and bear the title of king but he had nothing of his own save one estate of small value where he had a home and a small body of servants when he had to travel he used a covered cart drawn by oxen and driven by a rustic retainer in this style he travelled to and fro to his palace or to the annual gatherings of the people the work of administration and all matters of policy at home and abroad were in the hands of the mayor within a year of the establishment of peace chilperic died and was succeeded by theuderic on his death about seven thirty seven charles did not trouble to find another merovingian to fill the vacant throne but contented himself with dating his official documents the nth year after the death of theuderic the special task that lay before charles as before each new mayor at his accession was the restoration of the authority of the franks over the outlying parts of the ancient frank dominions that had lapsed into practical independence in the confusion of the previous period relying on the support of his austrasian warriors he struck eastward and southward and restored the old frontiers of the empire two provinces in particular claimed his attention the first of these was bavaria originally occupied by a teutonic tribe who had subdued the celtic boii and taken possession of their land the territory was ruled by native chiefs who admitted the overlordship of the frankish kings but lived in practical independence their relations were naturally close with the lombards on the other side of the alps and we have already seen a bavarian princess married to the lombard king egelolf and helping to extend christianity among the lombards several missionaries had begun to evangelize bavaria rupert of Worms, emeran of poitiers and corbinian there is a good deal that is obscure in the story of bavaria in the early part of the eighth century but about 725 charles martel and the lombard king liutprand appear to have invaded the country and a few years later charles again attacked bavaria and carried off a bavarian princess schwanehild whom he married after the somewhat vague frankish fashion and by whom he had a son griffo who was destined to play a part in the subsequent history bavaria appears to have once more accepted the frankish yoke for a time one result of the reassertion of frankish supremacy in bavaria was the organization of the bavarian church by the great missionary bishop boniface acting under instructions from rome aquitaine had also drifted away from subjection to the frankish rulers we have no record of the process by which this province which retained more than any other part of the empire of clovis its ancient roman character secured the practical independence to which it had attained by the time of charles martel we have already seen udo of aquitaine taking a share in the war between neustria and austrasia that raised charles to power after this the relations between the frankish mayor and the aquitanian duke were for a time friendly aquitaine had need of the support and friendship of the franks for the duchy was menaced by a danger with which it was not able to cope alone the moslem conquerors of spain had contrived to make their yoke tolerable to the inhabitants of the country whom they left in undisturbed possession of their lands and religion subject to a produce and poll tax from the latter of which all moslems were exempt but while the subject people accepted their fate with resignation quarrels broke out between the tribes of the conquerors and spain shared the general tendency to disintegration that throughout the moslem world followed on the great period of conquest the only way to check these internal contests was to continue the work of conquest and accordingly 
the leaders of the spanish moors began to penetrate beyond the pyrenees and menace the duchy of aquitaine in seven twenty they captured the town of narbonne and overran all the province of septimania but udo compelled them to retreat from before toulouse and so gave the first check to the advance of moslem conquest in the west five years later we find them advancing as far as autun in burgundy for udo had now become involved in a struggle with charles due probably to an attempt of the frankish ruler to reassert his overlordship over the province udo had even gone so far as to give his daughter in marriage to an arab chief open war broke out in 731 and aquitaine had already been ravaged by the austrasian army when the domestic feud was suddenly stilled by the tempest of moslem invasion that burst through the barrier of the pyrenees udo's son-in-law was slain by the moorish leader abderrahman and in the spring of 732 he reached the garonne and lay siege to bordeaux udo advancing to the relief of the city was defeated and his army nearly destroyed the moslems marched on toward the loire while udo fled to charles to implore his aid the crisis was grave for only a frankish victory could save gaul from falling a prey to the saracens but charles and his austrasian warriors reinforced probably by levies from the other races under his rule met the moslem host between poitiers and tours where charles took up a strong position and awaited the assault of the enemy after seven days of reconnoitring abderrahman ordered a frontal attack and the moslem soldiers threw themselves against the serried ranks of the franks much as the normans long after charged the saxon lines on the slope of senlac but the franks stood firm and with their long swords worked havoc in the ranks of the enemy night fell on the scene of carnage and when the frank army marched out next day to renew the fight they found the saracen camp deserted and the enemy fled leaving rich spoils for the austrasian warriors to bear home with them seven thirty two three years later udo died and charles was obliged to march into aquitaine to secure for his son hunold the recognition of the frankish overlordship then in 737 war again broke out between the saracens and the franks through the treachery of a certain duke morantus of provence the moslems gained possession of the two great cities of arles and avignon charles busy with a war in the north sent an army under the command of a half-brother childebrand he himself followed soon after in time to share in the capture of avignon and the defeat of the invaders in a great battle near narbonne according to one chronicler liutprand king of the lombards sent a detachment of troops to aid in this struggle which went on for a year longer and ended in winning back all provence from the moslems this campaign closed the warlike activities of the great mayor of the palace though not much over fifty years of age his health began to fail and such fighting as needed to be done against saxons or frisians he left to his two sturdy sons the most important incident of these years was the appeal renewed more than once from pope gregory the third for charles's help against the lombards liutprand was a trusted friend and ally of the frankish ruler and for this reason alone it is easy to understand charles's reluctance to embark on a campaign against him it is difficult to know what to make of the story that gregory offered charles the office of consul as the price of his intervention if he really did so he offered what he had no right to give another aspect of the policy of charles deserves attention in spite of his championship of christendom on the field of tours and his support of boniface and his colleagues charles fares ill at the hands of later ecclesiastical chroniclers the reason for this is that he is accused of having robbed the church in order to reward his followers the facts are that in the confusion of the earlier times the church had acquired a very large amount of land and that charles had not enough crown lands left to reward his officers in the usual way by grants of land charles therefore resorted to the expedient of resuming crown lands that had been alienated into ecclesiastical hands 
or appointing his warriors as prelates or abbots so that they might draw the revenues of religious foundations it is interesting to see emerging already the problem that was destined for ages to disturb the peace of germany till the final secularization of church lands in the napoleonic time laid it at last to rest charles died on the twenty second of october seven forty one and was buried at the great church of st denis near paris having ruled the franks for twenty five years End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Dawn of Medieval Europe, four seventy six to nine eighteen by J. H. B. Masterman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Pippin, King of the Franks. In accordance with the Frank law of inheritance, the dominions of Charles fell at his death to his two sons, Carloman and Pippin the former taking Austrasia and the dependent territories of the east, while Neustria and Burgundy fell to Pippin. But so close was the accord between the two brothers that they practically acted as joint rulers of the whole Frank kingdom. For his younger son Grifo, whose position as the child of an irregular marriage was so like his own, Charles appears to have made some provision by carving out a little area at the frontier of Neustria and Austrasia, with a capital at the city of Laon, which was destined more than two hundred years later to be the last stronghold of the Carolingian house. No sooner had the death of Charles become known than disturbances began in all directions. Aquitaine, Schwabia, and Saxony attempted to throw off the Frankish yoke, and Grifo appears to have headed a rising of malcontent Neustrian nobles. After a siege in Laon, he and his mother, the Bavarian Schwanehilt, were captured. Schwanehilt was sent to a monastery near Paris, where we lose sight of her, and Grifo kept in prison for years in a fortress of the Ardennes before turning to the task of repressing the rebellious provinces the two mayors determined to give technical legality to their position by placing a merovingian on the throne they found somewhere a certain childeric who served their purpose and him they enthroned as the last king of the old royal house of clovis then they marched against odilo duke of bavaria in seven forty three who only a short time before had married their sister Hiltrudis against their wish, but with the approval and perhaps at the instigation of Schwanehild. In some way that is not very clear this marriage was connected with the rebellion of Odilo against the Frankish overlordship. Odilo appears in some accounts as the organizer of a great alliance of malcontent provinces, Aquitaine, Alemannia, and even the Slavs of the north. But the two mayors marched straight on Bavaria, and met the Bavarian forces on the borders of the duchy, where the river Lesch flows to join the Danube. Here, after facing each other for fifteen days, they joined battle, and the Bavarians were broken. Odilo escaped, but was subsequently captured, imprisoned, and then a year later restored to his duchy. He died soon after, leaving a little son, Tassilo, of whom we shall hear again. The next three years, from 744 to 746, were years of constant warfare with Saxons, Alemannians, and Aquitanians. The only episode that needs specific record is the expedition of Carloman against the Alemannians in 746, when he is said to have invited them to meet him at a gemat or assembly at Cannstatt, and then surrounded them with Frankish troops and put a large number to the sword. Such acts of treachery are not uncommon in the record of these days, but the sequel is more unusual. Struck with contrition at his own deed, Carloman determined to expiate it by laying down his office and adopting the monastic life. In this year, says the chronicler, Carloman laid open to his brother Pippin a thing upon which he had long been meditating, namely his desire to relinquish his secular life and serve God as a monk. So, in 747, Carloman set out for Rome, where he received the tonsure and founded a monastery at Mount Soricht. 
after a time he moved on to monte cassino where he delighted in performing the most menial tasks till his name and history being betrayed by his servant he was accorded a more honourable position of him we shall hear again meanwhile pippin was left as sole mayor of francia and his first act was one of ill-judged clemency he liberated grifo from captivity and endowed him with large revenues but grifo proved as intractable as he had been six years before he fled to the saxons whom he stirred up to revolt and when pippin marched into saxony he escaped into bavaria where he succeeded in getting possession of the little duke tassilo and his mother on the advance of pippin the bavarians surrendered grifo who was then forgiven by his brother and given substantial territories in neustria with le mans as his capital but all was in vain and grifo continued to stir up trouble for pippin till the year seven fifty three when in the act of crossing the alps to join the lombards who were on the eve of a war with the franks he was intercepted by two counts of pippin's army and in the skirmish that followed all three were killed his death though he was a traitor to his country was a cause of grief to pippin before this event an important change had come to the frankish kingdom since grimoald's ill-fated attempt to dispossess the merovingian line the house of st arnulf had been content with the substance of power leaving the form of it to the kings whom they set up it is not possible to say what motives led pippin to desire to end this anomalous position possibly in a country that the efforts of boniface and his monks were rapidly making christian pippin felt that the religious sanction of a royal consecration might strengthen the authority of his house whatever the motive may have been the facts are thus narrated by the monastic chronicler in the year seven fifty of the lord's incarnation pippin sent ambassadors to rome to pope zacharias to ask concerning the kings of the franks who were of the royal line and were called kings but had no power in the kingdom save only that charters and privileges were drawn in their names but on the first day of march in the campus according to ancient custom gifts were offered to these kings by the people and the king himself sat in the royal seat with the army standing around him and he commanded on that day whatever was decreed by the franks but on all other days he stayed at home pope zacharias therefore in the exercise of his apostolic authority replied to their question that it seemed to him better and more expedient that the man who held power in the kingdom should be called king and be king rather than he who falsely bore that name therefore the aforesaid pope commanded the king and the people of the franks that pippin who was exercising the royal power should be called king and occupy the royal seat which was therefore done by the anointing of the holy archbishop boniface in the city of soissons there pippin is proclaimed king and childeric who was falsely called king is tonsured and sent into a monastery here then we reach the meeting place of the old and the new pippin is lifted as frankish kings had been lifted for unnumbered generations before him on the shields of the warriors and saluted as king but he is also as no other frankish king had ever yet been anointed in the church at soissons as a christian king but what was the share of the pope in all this we may be sure that the inquiry of the franks was never intended to imply any right over the frankish throne vested in the roman bishop but a change in the royal dynasty was a religious act if disapproved by the religious authorities it would be deprived of its value and boniface was likely to use all his influence to persuade the mayor of the palace to act in accord with the wishes of the pope in this important step the whole incident shows how much more close and harmonious the relations of pippin were with the ecclesiastical authorities than those of his illustrious father and it also marks the beginning of a new chapter in the history of europe in which the fortunes of the frank kingdom and the roman see which had hitherto had little relation to each other become so intertwined as to make inevitable at last the formal recognition of their mutual dependence in the coronation of charles the great fifty years later 
for some years after this time the main interest of pippin's reign centres in his relations with italy which can be more conveniently dealt with in the next chapter it was not until 756 that pippin was free to turn his attention to the affairs of his own kingdom his first task was the usual contest with the rebellious saxons of this turbulent people we shall have more to say when we deal with their conquest by charles the great pippin's campaign reduced them to a measure of submission and the promise of annual tribute shortly after this pippin completed the work of driving the saracens out of the province of septimania moslem rule which depended largely on gothic dislike for the franks had already been undermined and on the promise that their local independence should be preserved the visigoths of narbonne rose slew the saracen garrison and opened the gates to the frankish king the pyrenees became once more the boundary line of saracen rule the closing years of pippin's reign from 759 to 768 were spent in a great struggle with waif duke of aquitaine who made a determined bid for independence the reduction of the province proved no easy task and in the middle of the war pippin's nephew tassilo of bavaria deserted the army and declared that he would serve under his uncle's flag no more pippin was too fully occupied with aquitaine to punish tassilo's treachery and it was not until 768 after nearly nine years of war that the death of waif brought his duchy once more under the frankish rule pippin's settlement of the province was statesmanlike and wise he made no attempt to extend the laws of the franks to a people who still accounted themselves romans but enacted that all men romans and salians alike should keep their own laws and that if any man should come from another province he should live according to the law of his own country the settlement of aquitaine was pippin's last work he died in september seven sixty eight at the age of fifty four worn out by the labours of a strenuous reign of almost constant fighting of pippin's personal character we know scarcely anything the tradition that he was small of stature is late but may be true he is reputed to have been a man of great physical strength and he was certainly shrewd and brave his interest in the work of boniface leads one to think of him as sincerely anxious for the extension of christianity in his kingdom his greatest work was the extension of frankish influence beyond the alps in the land that was destined to cast so strange a spell for generations over the rulers of those german lands that he ruled so long and so well End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of the Dawn of Medieval Europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by J. H. B. Masterman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Pope, the Lombards, and the Franks. Charles Martel, Liutprand, King of the Lombards, Leo the Isaurian, and Gregory the Second all begin to play their part in history within a few years of each other and while charles declined as we have seen to be drawn into italian affairs the other three form a group around which italian history centres dr hodgkin ingeniously compares the contest of this period to the litigation that might go on in an english parish between an absentee landlord a big nonconformist farmer and a cultured but acquisitive parson the emperor is the absentee landlord represented by the exarch of ravenna the lombard king is the farmer and the pope is the parson liutprand seven twelve to seven forty three was perhaps the best of all the lombard kings it is unfortunate that we are so largely dependent for our knowledge of this period on papal chroniclers and letters for the unmeasured terms in which the popes denounce the lombard kings gives us no sort of idea of their real character but the prosperity of the lombard kingdom during the thirty years of liutprand's reign and his friendship with charles martel who sent his son pippin to him to be dubbed as a knight attest the wisdom of his rule he had been king for fourteen years when the edict of leo against images 
the story of which will be told in another chapter set all italy in a blaze for the edict not only involved a claim on the part of the emperor to legislate on religious questions without any consultation with the pope it also struck at a cherished part of the religious life of the italian people an attempt of scholasticus the exarch of ravenna to publish the edict led to a riot in ravenna and the duke of naples was murdered by a mob when he tried to enforce it in his territories gregory put himself at the head of the opposition and wrote vigorous outspoken and discourteous letters to the emperor warning him of the error of his proceedings meanwhile liutprand seized the opportunity to march into the exarchate where city after city opened its gates to him and at length ravenna itself fell into his hands the exarch escaping to venice which remained loyal to the emperor but as soon as liutprand's back was turned the exarch aided by a venetian army recovered the city which an outbreak of rebellion by the dukes of spoleto and beneventum prevented liutprand from attacking again the recalcitrant dukes were soon reduced to order but in the meanwhile the exarch acting on orders from the emperor marched to rome to seize the person of the pope while the siege was in progress liutprand and his army arrived outside the city and the pope threw himself on the protection of the lombard king who received him with the utmost respect and constituting himself as arbiter arranged a general pacification the exarch retaining the city of ravenna but surrendering to liutprand the other cities that were already in his hands leo's second and more drastic edict of seven thirty only served to arouse even stronger opposition in italy and almost the last act of gregory's life was the assembling of a council of italian bishops to anathematize all who refused to worship images in the following year he died he had been the first pope for a long time who was a roman by birth and he is recorded to have been an earnest restorer of churches and monasteries ruined by the contest of the previous period to his time in office also belongs the visit to rome of ina king of the west saxons who after reigning for thirty-seven years renounced his kingdom and came with his wife ethelburga as a pilgrim to rome where he stayed for the short remainder of his life founding it is said a saxon school in rome for his fellow countrymen gregory the second was succeeded by a syrian pope gregory the third seven thirty one to seven forty one who is said to have been compelled to accept the papal office while assisting at the funeral of his predecessor he is the last pope whose election was confirmed by the exarch of ravenna acting for the emperor the first few years of the new pope were peaceful the opposition of the italians to the iconoclastic decrees cut off italy almost entirely from the empire and the exarch clinging desperately to his one remaining stronghold of ravenna could do nothing to restore imperial authority peace was broken at last through what appears to be a foolish challenge thrown down to the lombard king by gregory the duke of spoleto having made an unsuccessful attempt to throw off the overlordship of liutprand took refuge in rome and gregory refused to surrender him liutprand promptly marched against rome capturing the papal towns on his way and laid siege to the city gregory terrified at the prospect of falling into the hands of the lombards wrote frantic appeals to charles martel drawing harrowing pictures of the desolation and ruin of the roman church and imploring charles as he valued his soul's salvation to haste to the rescue but charles already drawing near his end remained unmoved and within a few months both he and gregory died seven forty one to the new pope zacharias liutprand behaved with the greatest consideration on his promising that he would give no more help to the duke of spoleto he restored all the papal cities that he had captured and added rich gifts to the roman church two years later he died leaving the lombard kingdom in its highest condition of prosperity undisturbed by internal divisions and at peace with its great northern neighbour liutprand was succeeded by a nephew hildebrand 
who proved himself an incompetent ruler, was deposed in a few months to make room for Ratkis, Duke of Friuli. For five years or so Ratkis remained at peace with the Pope, then for some reason that is not clear he broke the truce and laid siege to Perugia. Zacharias, who had already exercised his personal influence over Liutprand in the last year of his life, when he dissuaded him from a projected attack on Ravenna, now gave an even more striking evidence of his personal power, for when he visited the Lombard camp to dissuade Rodkis from his warlike design, he so influenced the king that with his wife and daughters he repaired to Rome, there took monastic vows, and joined the Benedictines at the great monastery of Monte Cassino. He was succeeded by his brother Aistolf, who, while Zacharias lived, appears to have held his restless and turbulent ambition in check. The last important act of Zacharias's pontificate was the sanction he gave to the transference of the Frankish crown from the Merovingian line to Pippin. He died in 752, and after a Pope Stephen, who only held office for three days, Stephen II succeeded. The new Pope was a Roman by birth, and had been brought up in the papal palace under Gregory II. He therefore inherited the traditions of papal policy. What these traditions were can be seen by reference to a celebrated document, which probably first saw the light at about this time. The document is the donation of Constantine, and purports to be a decree of the first Christian empire granting immense dignities and possessions to the Roman bishop. After giving to the occupant of the papal see supremacy over the sees of Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople, and sovereignty over all the priests in the world, and appointing the church in the Lateran palace as the head and summit of all the churches in the whole world. It goes on to grant to the Roman clergy various ceremonial privileges. They may ride on horses with white saddle-cloths, and wear white shoes like the senators, and the Pope is to wear an imperial tiara, wherewith the emperor in person has crowned him. Then follows the important clause on which so vast a superstructure was destined to be built. Wherefore, that the pontifical crown may be adorned with glory and influence beyond the dignity of the earthly empire, we hand over and relinquish our palace, the city of Rome, and all the provinces, places, and cities of Italy, and the western region, to the most blessed pontiff and universal Pope Sylvester, and we ordain by our pragmatic constitution that they shall be governed by him and his successors, and we grant that they shall remain under the authority of the Holy Roman Church. No one now believes that Constantine made any such donation as this, but it does not follow that the document is a mere forgery. It represents a tradition that was growing up at the papal court at this critical period, when Rome had need of all the weapons, legal as well as material, that she could enlist in her service against the ambition and strength of the Lombards. The imperial cause in Italy was clearly doomed, and as the power of the empire decayed, the prospect of the establishment of a new Italian kingdom, as large as and more stable than that of Theodoric, began to appear as an imminent danger. Under Aistolf's restless and able leadership, 749 to 756, the Lombard menace soon grew pressing. In 751, the Lombard king marched against Ravenna, which now fell finally into his hands, the last exarch taking refuge in Sicily. Then, after one more campaign against Spoleto, the king began to close in on his destined victim, the Pope. As ruler of Ravenna, what more natural than that he should claim the same authority over Rome that previous rulers of Ravenna had exercised? Accordingly, the strife began with demands for tribute and recognition from the Pope. In vain embassy after embassy from Rome confronted the Lombard king. In vain holy abbots from the most renowned monasteries of Italy interceded for peace. The king remained inexorable. Then a new figure appears upon the scenes, John the imperial Silentiarius, 
bearing a letter from the emperor demanding from Aistolf the return of the lands he had seized and charging the pope to secure their restoration to all which stephen can only reply by a last appeal to the emperor to come to the deliverance of the city but while the emperor was unable to respond to the appeal there was another power from which help might be secured and stephen sent a private letter to pippin suggesting that he should invite him to visit the frankish court the frankish king must have recognized that by accepting this proposal he was committing himself to the championing of the cause of the pope against the ancient allies of his people but the spell that had drawn visigoth ostrogoth and lombard from the danube to the tiber was now drawing the greatest of the teutonic peoples toward the same goal the ten years that had passed since the death of charles had greatly strengthened the influence of the papacy in northern europe boniface now nearly at the end of his strenuous life had done splendid service for the papal cause and the support given by zacharias to the deposition of the last of the merovingians had forged a new bond of union between rome and francia pippin sent two messengers to convey his invitation to the pope and stephen sent back two letters one addressed to the king and the other to the frankish nobles who might be expected to show less enthusiasm than the king for a campaign against the lombards meanwhile a fresh envoy had come from constantinople charging the pope to go in person to demand from the lombard king the restoration of the imperial territory a messenger sent to aistolf to demand a safe conduct for the pope returned with the necessary guarantee just as two distinguished franks arrived to conduct the pope across the alps these were duke outcar and schrodegang bishop of metz the most important church leader next to boniface in francia stephen accordingly set out for pavia professedly to support the demands of the imperial envoys but really to demand permission to visit the frankish court a demand that backed up by the support of pippin's two representatives the lombard king dared not refuse to cross the great st bernard in november was no easy task but the pope and his companions safely reached the monastery of samaris at Algonum, where full rod of st denis and duke roland met the travellers to escort them to the court pippin himself with his family came south to a royal palace at pontion in champagne and the king sent his eldest son charles of whom we now hear for the first time to meet the pope so on the sixth of january seven fifty four king and pope met outside pantheon the meeting may rightly be judged one of the most important events in european history for if pippin had not decided to espouse the cause of the pope nothing could have saved rome from falling into the hands of the lombards and while the frankish kings free from the entanglement of italian affairs would have been able to devote themselves to the building up of their own territories the lombards might have united italy under one rule and so the work of bismarck and cavour might have been forestalled by a thousand years but these things were not to be having undertaken to support the cause of the pope pippin was solemnly crowned with his wife and sons and an anathema pronounced on any who should hereafter attempt to dispossess the family of pippin as pippin had dispossessed the merovingians at the same time stephen conferred on pippin the title of patrician a title that had generally been held by the exarch of ravenna and that strictly speaking the emperor alone had the right to grant this act like all of stephen's course of action at this crisis implied a practical repudiation of imperial authority in italy it was for himself and not for the emperor that the pope requested from pippin the sovereignty of the exarchate and its subject lands but however willing pippin might be to champion the cause of the pope questions of peace and war could not among the franks be decided on the mere word of the king and accordingly a general assembly of the frankish nobles was held near soissons at which pippin was able not without considerable difficulty to persuade his chief men to agree to the war 
or at least to the opening of such negotiations with Aistolf as might probably end in armed conflict. At this juncture a dramatic scene occurred. Carloman, sent apparently by the abbot of Monte Cassino, suddenly appeared at the court to plead for peace between his brother and the Lombard king. We do not know what motives led him to this step, which the papal chronicler attributes to the devilish persuasions of Aistolf. We only know that Pippin turned a deaf ear to his appeals and sent him to a monastery somewhere in the Frankish kingdom where he died soon after, a pathetic end for one who had been a great warrior and in all but name a king. What promises exactly Pippin made to the Pope in regard to the Italian possessions of the empire is a matter of controversy. If any document was, as later papal chroniclers believe, drawn up, no trace of it now remains. It is probably true that Pippin intended to secure for the Pope the exarchate of Ravenna. He certainly did not intend to wrest these lands from Aistolf merely to hand them over to the Emperor, nor did he contemplate at this stage the extension of his own rule to the lands beyond the Alps. While preparing for this expedition to Italy, Pippin made strenuous efforts to secure by negotiation the cession of the lands that Aistolf had seized. It was only when all negotiations proved useless that the host gathered near Soissons for the great expedition. An advanced guard succeeded in driving Aistolf from Susa, where he was watching the passes of the Alps, and the main army, crossing without any fighting, laid siege to Pavia. Finding resistance useless, Aistolf surrendered, promising to restore Ravenna and other cities to the Pope and the Roman Republic. But no sooner had Pippin and his warriors recrossed the Alps than fresh difficulties arose, and a series of piteous appeals from the Pope reached the Frankish court. Aistolf, whose heart the devil has invaded, has restored nothing, but was heaping such insults on the Holy Church that the very stones might weep. Pippin might have listened unmoved to these complaints if Aistolf had not put himself hopelessly in the wrong by laying siege to Rome and demanding the surrender of the person of the Pope. For three months the siege went on, and the Pope waxed more urgent in his appeals for help. On you, after God and St. Peter, depend the lives of all the Romans. If we perish, all the nations of the earth will say, Where is the confidence of the Romans? which they placed in the kings and the nation of the Franks. When personal appeal seemed in vain, the Pope wrote a letter purporting to be addressed by St. Peter to the kings, bishops, and nobles of the Franks, wherein the apostle urges the Franks, as they value their souls, to haste to the rescue of that city of Rome which is under the special care of the writer. Early in 756, Pippin set out for another expedition into Italy. At Pavia he was met by two envoys from the emperor, who tried to persuade him to restore the exarchate to the empire, a proposal to which the king emphatically refused to consent. Aistolf was soon reduced to submission, and this time the Frankish king took good care to ensure the fulfilment of the treaty by which twenty-three cities in the exarchate were to be handed over to the pope. The keys of the surrendered cities were placed in the sepulchre of St. Peter in Rome, and by that act the Pope at once acquired the status of a sovereign prince and repudiated his subjection to the empire. In the following year Aistolf died, killed by a fall from his horse while out hunting. For the vacant throne two claimants appeared. One of these was a powerful Lombard lord, Desiderius, Duke of Tuscany, a favorite of the late king, but apparently a man of humble birth. The other was Rotkis, who after seven years of monastic life at Monte Cassino, suddenly escaped to Pavia, and there for three months ruled as king. War between the rival claimants seemed inevitable, but Desiderius succeeded in securing the support of the Pope by the promise of Bologna and several other cities that Liutprand had captured long ago from the exarchate. Rotkis retired from the unequal contest, and part of the promised territory was handed over to the Pope by the new king of the Lombards. Just after this, Stephen died, and was succeeded by his brother Paul, 
who occupied the papal chair through ten comparatively uneventful years the relations between the pope and the franks remained close and cordial though pippin took no further share in italian affairs and paul contrived to live on terms of comparative peace with his lombard neighbours the pope and the frankish king died within a year of each other and a new period of confusion and contest followed in italy ending at last in a new frankish intervention and the final end of the lombard kingdom end of chapter 13